I tell you that Andrew Jackson, that great volcano at Washington, is belching forth a lava of political corruption which is sweeping over the length and breadth of this land, leaving unscathed no green spot, no living thing. Sangamon County, take warning. Send me, John T. Stewart, back to the legislature, and I'll see that every Jackson man in office is whipped out of the place like a dog out of a meat house. And now, my friends, I bow to one of your own citizens of New Salem, who will address you further on behalf of the great and incorruptible Whig party. God bless it. <laughs> Fellow citizens, I presume you all know who I am. I'm plain Abraham Lincoln. I've been solicited by many friends to become a candidate for the legislature. My politics are short and sweet, like the old woman's dance. I'm in favor of a national bank internal improvement system and high protective tariff. These are my sentiments and political principles. If elected, I shall be thankful. If not, it'll be all the same. Somebody wants to do business with you. Howdy, ma'am. Howdy. Howdy. How you been making out? Right good. We ain't hit the hard place yet. Won't you get down and rest yourself? Well, thank you. We was aiming to stretch a bit. My old woman figured on getting some flannel for shirts. I reckon that could be arranged. <laughs> We ain't got any money. Well, you can send it to me. We don't aim to ask for no credit. If it leaves your mind any, ma'am, the whole shebang here is worked on credit. <laughs> That's right, Abe. <laughs> Barry and me never put up a penny to start with. From the way things look, we never will. Well, there's an old barrel in the wagon that might be worth 50 cents to some folks. Well, of course, there ain't much in it. Just some old things laying around the house, along with some books that belong to my grandpappy. Books? In the last barrel. Books. Well, you folks go in the store and help yourself. I'll go back and get the barrel. Blackstone's commentaries. That's law. Law? I knew that book was about something. I don't need some mark on it, either. No, sir. We took mighty good care of it. Reckon you can read it, sir? I expect I can make head or tails out of it. I set my mind to it. and liberty, rights to acquire and hold property. Wrongs are violations of those rights. By gee, that's all there is to it, right and wrong. 
long. Maybe I ought to begin to take this up serious. Hello, Mr. Lincoln. Abe. Hello, Ann. Give me a minute to try and untangle myself. Aren't you afraid you'll put your eyes out, reading like that upside down? Trouble is, Ann, when I'm standing up, my mind's lying down. When I'm lying down, my mind's standing up. Of course, allowing I got a mind. You've a wonderful mind, Abe, and you know it. River's sure pretty today, ain't it? You think a lot about things, don't you? Oh, well, my brain gets to itching inside sometimes. I gotta scratch it. Father says you've a real head on your shoulders. And away with people, too. He says it's not all just making them laugh. They remember what you say because it's got sense to it. Mr. Ruffage is a mighty fine man, Ann, but if you ask me, I'm more like the old horse the fellas trying to sell. Sound of skin and skeleton and free from faults and faculties. I know how smart you are. How ambitious you are, too. Ambitious? You are deep down underneath. Even if you won't admit it. You gotta have education these days to get anywhere. I never went to school as much as a year in my whole life. Oh, but you've educated yourself. You've read poetry and Shakespeare and now law. I just had my heart set on you're going over to Jacksonville to college when I go to the seminary there. Mighty pretty, Ann. Some folks I know don't like red hair. I do. Do you, Abe? I love red hair. Nothing like them in your life, sitting there in the snow like scared rabbits. But the woods are full of them, too. The snow's nice, ain't it, the way it's drifting? Ice is breaking up. It's coming in the spring. Still up a tree. Just can't seem to make up my mind what to do. Maybe I ought to go into the law, take my chances. I admit I got kind of taste for something different than this in my mouth. 
still, I don't know. I feel such a fool, set myself up as a no one so much. Of course, I know what you'd say. I've been hearing it every day, over and over again. Go on, Abe. Make something of yourself. You got friends, show them what you got in you. Oh, yes, I know what you'd say. But I don't know. And I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll let the stick decide. If it falls back toward me, then I stay here as I always have. If it falls forward toward you, then it's... Well, it's the law. Here goes, Anne. Just a little. doing in Springfield? Figuring on setting myself up as a lawyer. What do you know about law, Abe? Not enough to hurt me. Just hold your horses and sit down. Now, Brother Woolridge. Yes, sir. Brother Hawthorne here says you agreed to furnish him two yokes of oxen to break up 20 acres of prairie side ground. He did such. And that you were to allow him to raise a crop of corn on another piece of land. That's right. But he never done one thing he promised. Not one. He claims further that when he talked to you about these promises, you did strike, beat, then knock him down. Pluck, pull, and tear large quantities of hair from his head. And that with stick or fist, you did strike him many blows on or about the face, head, breast, back, shoulders, hips, and divers other parts of the body with violence did push, thrust, and gouge your fingers in his eyes. Yeah, I got witnesses to prove it. And for that, he demands $250 damages. Yes, I do. Well, Brother Woolridge, what you got to say to that? You forgot to put in there about me whopping him with a neck yoke. Now, it says here, Brother Hawthorne, that you owe Brother Woolridge $55.47 board at the rate of a dollar and a half a week. And you owe him $90 for use of a team and wagon for eight months, besides $100 cash on a loan. Yeah. No, I never said I didn't. Well, I ain't no lightning calculator, but according to my figuring, you owe him $245.47. You're asking $250 damages. Now, my idea is to split the difference of $4.53, which 
which by a strange coincidence happens to be exactly the amount of my legal fee. And the whole thing's settled. Well, what do you say? We won't do it. Me either. I'll go to law first. Gentlemen, did you ever hear about the time in the Black Hawk War when I butted two fellas' heads together and busted both of them? Well, I'm willing if he is. It ain't fair, but I'll do it just to be shut of him. Thanks, gentlemen. Well, that's going to save us all a heap of legal trouble and headaches. Well, if you just give me my and Stuart's share, I'll mosey along over and see the parade. It's going to be a heap of yelling and carrying on. It's going to be quite a pleasure to listen to after this. Yes, sirree, Bob. Yes, sirree, Bob. who's just come up from Lexington to visit us, Miss Mary Todd. Mr. Lincoln, I've been hearing some mighty fine things about you. I doesn't believe everything Douglas here says about me. You kind of straddle different political fences. Oh, but I haven't been discussing you with any other gentlemen. My sister told me about you. You're in the legislature, aren't you? If you put that in the past tense, I'll plead guilty. I was in the legislature. Mr. Lincoln's practicing law with John Stewart, my opponent for Congress. It's a mighty flattering way he puts it, ma'am. When what I'm really doing is wearing a hole in Stewart's best rocking chair. First, I thought it was that apple for sure. And then I sank my teeth into that peach, and I just couldn't seem to make up my mind. So I sampled the apple again. You all can't do that to me. I right, go on back. 
What is it? It's a pie judging contest, Ma. I should have brought one of my sweet potato pies. You sure should, Miss Clay. <laughs> you sure win. I wish you had, Miss Clay. Uh -huh. They're so good. Look, he's sure hungry. <laughs> oh, yes, he is. <laughs> By the time I get the apple down, the peach it smells so good, I'm sure it's the best. So it goes. First one, then the other. Sangamon County, led by Buck Troop. The Speed Counter Demon, led by Eve Tyler. trouble get away from here. Adam, Matt. You better look out, Scrub. You're going to get hurt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are you going to use on me? Knives or pistols or your fists? Matt, <laughs> we ain't bothering nobody. We're just here to have a good time. So you please to leave us alone. Come on now, Matt. Come, <laughs> Come on, on now, Scrub. Adam. We got plenty Come of time on. later. Bye, honey. See you later. Adam. 
You just say that now. You wait till we're married and have babies to tend to. That'll be different. No, it won't, neither. Matt and Sarah have a baby, and they came. Yeah, but maybe we'll have lots of babies. Maybe we'll have twins uh, or something. I don't care. I don't care if we have 50 babies. Oh, Adam, you got to promise me. All right, Gary Sue, I promise. <laughs> Adam, I wished we was married right now, like, like Sarah and Matt. I've been meaning to talk to your family about us as soon as we get home. Did you? Did you? Honest, Adam. Oh, Adam. Adam, let's go back. Let's hurry for the light to tar barrels, huh? All right. Only I wish it was going to be that fella splitting them rails again. I'm due for a bag. No, no. Now, you folks go along. I'll sit with Oh, you go, Ma. It's my place to sit. No, no. You go. Me, Ma. I'll just go back over yonder. Let me get my coat. Hey, man. How about nip before we go? the four of you. Miss Clay, I wish you were very little. Yes, honestly, I do. I've seen so much now, I'm fit to pop. Now be careful and don't get in any trouble like I told you. Dead. Dead? Lord, have mercy on us. Cut right in the heart with his knife. Get the sheriff. Ma. Get the sheriff. Two fellas over there, they was fighting with Scrub. And they cut him. He's a knife they done it with. Do something, sir. Which one of you fellas this knife here belong to? Me. No, me. I want the truth now. Which one of you cut him? I did. That ain't so. I did it. I tell you, it was me. He came after me with a gun one and One of you lying. Now, which one is it? Which one is it? Anybody see it? I reckon I did. 
Who are you? Their mother. Well, which one was it? I am saying. Matt, tell Adam, you please. Well, it don't make no difference anyhow. Under the law, they're both equally guilty. Sure. Yeah. Come on, you're under arrest. I'm a cast. I appoint you temporary deputy. Help me get these fellas down to the jail. Adam, Jim, you and Jake here, you stay here and take care of the body in this here night. I don't let nobody touch nothing till I get back. Hey, sure, man, a good job of it. I wonder who they go there. I swear I never saw him around here. I like stuff. He was mean, but I like him. Right in the back, too. What they need is a little taste of the rope. Well, what are we waiting for? <laughs> We gotta hurry. Who are you? I'm your lawyer, ma'am. Say is I can lick any man here hands down. <laughs> from my side. Well, you all know I'm just a fresh lawyer trying to get ahead. But some of you boys act like you want to do me out of my first clients. <laughs> I'm not saying you fellas are not right. Maybe these boys do deserve to hang. But with me handling their case, don't look like you'll have much to worry about on that score. <laughs> All I'm asking is to have it done with some legal pomp and show. That's right. all right, Abe. Right. 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 on our right. side of it. Right. We've gone to a heap of trouble not to have at least one hanging. Sure you have, Mac. And if these boys had more than one life, I'd say go ahead. Maybe a little hanging mightn't do them any harm. 
But the sort of hanging you boys had given would be so... so permanent. <laughs> <laughs> Trouble is, when men start taking the law into their own hands, they're just zapped in all the confusion and fun to start hanging somebody who's not a murderer, somebody who is. And the next thing you know, they're hanging one another just for fun. Till it gets to a place a man can't pass a tree or look at a rope without feeling uneasy. We seem to lose our heads in times like this. We do things together that we'd be mighty ashamed to do by ourselves. For instance, you take Jeremiah Carter yonder. There's not a finer, more decent, God-fearing man in Springfield than Jeremiah Carter. And I wouldn't be surprised if when he goes home, he takes down a certain book and looks into it. Maybe you just happen to hit on these words. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Why don't you put it down for a spell, boys? Ain't it getting heavy? That's all I've got to say, friends. Good night. you got here, ma'am. Well gentle. You won't let nothing happen to Adam and Matt. Don't you worry about a thing. I'll keep my eye on him, all right. Matt, he don't eat much at all, but Adam's just a boy. He's sure to get hungry. Well, they'll get plenty with a sheriff's wife in the kitchen. I, uh, I want to talk much, but after what you've done for us today... Yeah, no. Save your thanks. leg lawyer without much experience in this business. But as long as you want me, I'll do the best I can. Still, you might feel a lot safer if my partner was here. You could get Steve Douglas. We don't know nothing about lawyers or that kind of thing. Well, at any rate, I'll drop around in the morning and have a little talk with the boys. One of these days, I'll take a ride into the country and let you ladies know how things are coming. You know, my mother, Nancy Hanks, would be just about your age if she was alive. Got an idea she'd be a whole lot like you, too. A whole lot like you. Well, goodbye, ma'am. Watch out for the ruts. Get along, you. Get in.
Upon my word, ma'am, in all my experience, I've never danced with a more graceful and charming partner. Thank you so much. I'm awfully glad you don't share Mr. Lincoln's aversion to feminine society. Well, Mr. Lincoln's a great storyteller. Like all such actors, he revels in boisterous applause. Uh, and yet Ninian says it was his wit that saved those two wretched boys. Oh, yes, unquestionably, he has ability in handling an unthinking mob. Not even his enemies deny he has a certain political talent. Uh, Mr. Lincoln, are you by any chance a member of the well-known Lincoln family of Massachusetts? Not by any chance I know of, sir. A very fine family, sir. Very fine. Then I'd say the evidence is all against us belonging to it. And Lincoln I ever knew him out to hell of beans. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lincoln, in the part of the South I come from, it's customary for a gentleman to ask a visiting lady to dance. Wouldn't you care to ask me? I'd like to dance with you the worst way, ma'am, but since all the dancing I've ever done was behind a plow, I... Mr. Lincoln, I shall be very glad to dance this dance with you. Way I've ever seen. I warned you, ma'am. Shall we go outside and talk instead of dancing, Mr. Lincoln? I'd be delighted, ma'am. Lincoln, what are you up to now? Got the smell of the country in my nose, just riding out. <laughs> if a client comes by, Abe, where will we tell him you rent? In my office, of course. Where is your office, Abe? In my hat. that river, don't you? It's a mighty pretty river, Eve. Never saw a man like you look at a river like you do. Folks would think it was a pretty woman or something, the way you carry on. How come they call that thing you're playing a Jew's harp? It comes down from David's harp in the Bible. I don't want to say nothing against the Bible, but those people back there sure had funny tastes in music. <laughs> so what's that tune you're playing? Don't know. Catchy, though.
get you on a march or something. And that's a plenty. People used to say I could sink an axe deeper than anybody they ever saw. Well, that's still not bad for a city feller. certainly takes me back to the time when I was just a little old shirt tail boy in Kentucky. Our place is just about this size, too. One window, I remember, and dirt floor. Some wild crab apple trees out in the front yard. The big hearth inside where I used to stretch out while my mother read to me. I'll never forget how bad I felt the day we decided to pull up stakes and head for Indiana. Kentucky's a mighty fine place to live, but with all the slaves coming in, white folks had a hard time making a living. And you folks just like my folks. I said that to myself the minute I laid eyes on you. My mother would feel right at home with Mrs. Clay, I said. Now I know she would. Sarah, I bet you didn't know I had a sister once, just about your age. Named Sarah, too. Only she died when her baby was born. And I knew a girl like you, Carrie Sue. Named Ann. Ann died, too. Well, finished reading your letters yet? I read mine by myself, too. I never learned to read yet. I thought maybe you'd read it to me. Why, certainly. I'll be glad to. Dear Ma, I seat myself this evening to inform you that I and Matt are well and hoping these few lines may find you all enjoying the same blessings. We had turnip greens and pork chops for supper, but oh me, nobody can cook turnip greens like you, Ma. Matt always says nobody can cook turnip greens better than me. Sarah can cook them as good as anyone, so can Carrie soon. We've been treated mighty nice. The sheriff says he never had anybody in here who could beat me playing checkers. Well, Ma, I bet you wish we were there to do some plowing and laying in fresh meat. Oh, me, wouldn't a squirrel stew taste good? Yeah. Them boys were great ones for hunting. A preacher comes in regular and reads us the Bible. I'm fixing to learn me a whole psalm if I don't get hung first. Well, my pen is bad. My ink is pale. My love for you will never fail. Adam. Sarah, do you suppose you've got an extra piece of paper in the house? I want to make some notes while I'm talking to your mother. We ain't got any paper that I know of. 
Well, we got a new almanac. Reckon you could write on it? An almanac? Why, yes. It's just a thing. Carrie Sue, my mouth's beginning to water for some of those turnip greens. Honest? You think there's anything you can do about that? Yeah, Sarah and me will fix some together. Thanks, Sarah. Now then, suppose you tell me something about the boys. Well, there ain't very much to tell. Your husband, he died? Yeah, the summer after we got here. We just finished building the house. It's a fine house, all right. Not a nail in it. No, he was mighty good with his hands. He was killed by a drunk Indian. It was long round sundown. I was just coming back from milking. Adam was clearing out the timber, and Matt was down with a fever. That Adam. I bet he knew what to do with an axe. Yeah. He takes after his father. Matt was always the puny one. Well, once when he was a baby, I, I held him for two days while he was burning up with lung sickness. Mrs. Clay, which one of your boys killed Scrub White? fight on our hands. I gotta know what I'm doing. I can't. Be just like choosing between them. What do you suppose made them both say they'd done it? Matt did because he's older. And Adam said so because Matt has a wife and baby. There are a lot of people who'd like to see those boys hang. I just can't. I got a pack of witnesses. A lot of mighty fine lawyers on the other side. It ain't no use. I can't. No, I don't reckon you can. away. Huh. <laughs> Mighty big crowd here today. All right, Mr. Clerk. We're ready. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. The Honorable Court of the Eighth Judicial Circuit of the State of Illinois is now in session. Judge Herbert A. Bell presiding. Is the state ready, Mr. Felder? May it please the court, the state of Illinois is ready, ready and waiting, sir. Then go ahead, gentlemen, and pick yourselves a jury. 
So your name's Bill Killian? Yes, sir. You don't like my clients, do you, Bill? No, sir, I don't. Well, tell me this. You any kin to old Jake Killian you slipped down in New Salem? Why, yes, sir, I'm his son. Well, Bill, if you take after your dad, you're a smart boy. And an honest one, too. Reckon he's all right with us, Your Honor. Clarence, how you stand on capital punishment? You mean, do I want to see them two fellas hung? I do. You're a blacksmith, aren't you? Sure. Well, there's going to be a heap of horseshoeing around here this week. I wouldn't want to keep you from your job. You're excused. Get going, Clarence. You say you've never discussed this case. No, sir, I never did. Ever hear anybody else discuss it? No, sir. How long you been a barber in this town? Oh, about 18 years going on. And you never heard it mentioned? No, sir, not that I remember. Do you know the uh, gentleman who is prosecuting this case, Mr. Felder? I guess I know him. And you're excused. Your Honor, this is a waste of time. Mr. Lincoln should know that the mere fact that a prospective juror knows counsel for the state does not disqualify him. I know that, John. What I'm afraid of is that some of the jurors might not know you. And that'd put me at a great disadvantage. <laughs> Get in, John. Sam Boone. Sam Boone. Guilty. No, no, Sam. Sit down. Sit down. You drink liquor, Sam? Yep. Cuss? Go to church regular? Enjoy hangings? Got a job? Just like the loaf, huh? Ever tell a lie? Well, you're just the kind of honest man we want on this jury. Take your place. All right, Mr. Prosecutor, your move. Gentlemen of the jury, thou shalt not kill. So says the Sixth Commandment, as handed down to Moses on Mount Sinai by the Lord God of Israel himself. Thou shalt not kill. But Matt and Adam Clay did not heed that command. They killed Scrub White. Two against one. They came at him with their deadly weapons. Two against one, and that one, a peace-loving servant of the law. From all I hear, Scrub was doing some mighty fancy fighting for a peace-loving man. True, Mr. Lincoln, true. For Scrub White was a man, an American in whose veins flowed the blood of pioneers who braved the wilderness to make this great state what it is. E he fought in self-defense as he would have fought against the wild beasts of the forest, for 
scrub white, loved life. He loved the blue of God's heaven, the soft caress of the south wind. He loved life, but he is dead. And there, gentlemen, there sit his murderers. I tell you, gentlemen, they must be wiped out as a man wipeth a plate. Why, 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 why. Come, men. You got to give the boys a fair trial. A jury trial. Before you hang them. Get going, John. John, it's a pure shame you aren't running for Congress or something. Or are you running for Congress or something? No, Mr. Lincoln. I'm here for the sole purpose of seeing justice done. Justice! My error. Sure a spellbinder from way back. As attorney for the state of Illinois, gentlemen, I shall prove that by their own confessions, the defendants did stab unto death the deceased. I shall prove that they were under the influence of an alcoholic beverage at the time. <gasps> And when I have proven these facts, gentlemen, I expect you as 12 loyal, intelligent, red-blooded citizens to find Adam and Matt Clay guilty of murder. <laughs> Call Sheriff Billings. Hi, Gail. You saw him to try to tell the truth. Hold I do. That truth, I've got. Sheriff, have you ever seen this knife before? Yes, sir. That's the knife they kill Scrub White with. Did you see him do it with a knife? No, but I... I just wanted to get you back in your groove. Go ahead. Your Honor. I must insist, if the learned counsel for the defense wishes to object, let him address the court, not my witness. You heard that, Abe. One thing more, Sheriff. Did you visit the wagon owned by the defendants? Yes, sir. Yes? And uh, what did you find there? A jug of liquor, about three quarters full. Did the boys deny they'd been drinking on the night of the crime? No, sir. They said they'd had a snort or two, as usual. As usual? Yes, sir. That's what they said, as usual. Thank you, Sheriff. Your witness. Where's the jug now? In my jail. Empty? Well, there's some left. How much? About one-fourth full. Who drank it? Well, never mind. That'll be our little secret. Tell me this. Did Scrub White have a pistol? He was a deputy. He had to have one. Do you know if he tried to use it on the defendants? No, sir. You don't know he didn't? No, sir. Sheriff. You ever hear about the fix the man was in when he was coming down the road with a pitchfork on his shoulder and the farmer's dog ran out and bit him on the leg? Mm, no, sir. That must have been out in my district. Well, then you probably don't recall that in defending himself, he stuck one of the prongs of the pitchfork into the dog and killed him. The farmer got pretty mad. What made you kill my dog, he said. Well, the fellow said, what made your dog bite me? Well, the farmer says, why, why didn't you go at him with the other end? To which the man replied, well, why didn't your dog come at me with the other end? <laughs> Pretty good, Gil. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, Sheriff, let's just suppose that my two defendants here were like that man with a pitchfork. Only, let's say, they've got a knife. And Scrub White was the farmer's dog, only instead of teeth, he's got a pistol. Well, now, wouldn't you say it was a matter of self-defense to use that blade, so long as Scrub didn't come at him with the other end of the pistol? Your Honor, I object and move that these remarks be stricken from the record. Counsel is presenting an argument. The counsel's remarks will be stricken from the record. The jury will disregard them. Now, you jurors, watch out. Don't remember about that dog. That's all. Just a moment. You don't... You don't, of your own knowledge, know that Scrub White came at them with the shooting end of the pistol, do you? No, sir. Therefore, That's the end the bullets usually come from, isn't it? Yes, sir. <clears throat> the, but you didn't see a shot fired, did you? No, sir. Then but you heard it. I heard something sounded like a shot. What do you figure you're best at, seeing or hearing? Hmm, well, both. That's what I figured. Step down. If you <clears throat> call Palmer Cass. Palmer Cass takes the stand. Oh, you saw Miss Webb tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I forgot. I do. What's your name? J. Palmer Cass. You knew Scrub White, didn't you? Sure. I knew him well. Uh, when was the last time you saw him? The night he was killed. Uh, you had spent a great part of that day with him, hadn't you? Well, I was with him all day, near Boss. Uh, tell me, Mr. Cass, uh, just what did you and Mr. White do that day? Well, we went to the parade first and then to the fairgrounds. We had supper down at the people's house and went back to the fairgrounds that night. I see. Yes, sir. And uh, do you recall where and under what circumstances you first saw the defendants? Well, we went on down to the tug of war, and there they were. First thing I knew, they was both cussing Scrub out and wanting to fight him. Why, well, it ain't so. It's a lie, sure enough. What did Mr. White do then? Well, he just laughed some more, and oh. asked him what they wanted to fight him with, knives, pistols, or fists. <laughs> and uh, how did he ask that? Uh, jokingly? Well, sure, he was laughing all the time. And that night, Mr. Cass, just before the killing, tell the jury what happened then. Well, Scrub and me had a little argument, and he went off by himself. The next thing I knew, I heard a shot. You uh, heard a shot? Yeah. I run down there as fast as I could, but the time I got there, Scrub was laying on the ground, and. Them two fellas was standing over me. And the knife was on the ground between the defendants? Yeah. And where was Mr. White's pistol? Well, it was in his holster. Uh, it went off then while he was trying to get it out of his holster. Yeah, I, I guess it did, yeah. Thank you. Your witness? You say your name's J. Palmer Cass. Yeah. What's a J stand for? John. Anybody ever call you Jack? Yes. Why J. Palmer Cass? Why not John P. Cass? Well, anything know. the matter with John P.? No, but... Has J. Palmer Cass anything to conceal? No. Then what do you part your name in the middle for? Well, I got a right to call myself anything I please as long as it's my own name. Well, if it's all the same to you, I'll just call you Jack Cass. I object to this ridiculous line of questioning. Mr. Lincoln's clownishness may win him a laugh from his friends, 
But I assure him, his entire game of buffoonery is lost on this intelligent jury. Stick to the point, Mr. Lincoln. I'll do my best, Your Honor. Well, J. Palmer Cass, you say you and Scrub White had a little argument. Yeah. Jackass. <laughs> I just got it. <laughs> <laughs> What kind of an argument? Well, I'd rather not say. Oh, you'd rather not say. Well, Jack, suppose I told you I'd rather you did say. All right. You want to know, so I'll tell you. We was arguing about politics. Well, that's something new to argue about. I found out a lot different since. But I said I figured you had more sense in politics than Steve Douglas. And Scrub got mad as a wet hen and said you didn't. <laughs> Cass, I reckon we can let all you said go in. Till we've heard from my side. Step down. <laughs> May it please the court. The next witness for the state is not, in the strictest sense, a witness for the prosecution. However, in the interest of mercy as well as justice, the state desires at this time to call upon a nigh witness to the killing of Scrub White. Mrs. Abigail Clay. Miss Clay? Don't well, tell him I did it. Miss Clay? You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be God. Bible. Say I do. I do. Take the stand. You are the mother of Adam and Matt Clay, aren't you? You love your boys, don't you? And you would like to save their lives if you could. I'm sure you would, Mrs. Clay. You were present the night Scrub White was killed, weren't you? I saw them fight. Uh, no, don't be afraid of me, Mrs. Clay. I'm not a bloodthirsty man. I have no desire to see you lose your two boys. In fact, no man could wish that less. So, on behalf of the great state of Illinois, on behalf of the people, I am prepared to offer you the life of one of your sons, provided you tell us which one of your boys stabbed and killed Scrub White. Don't prompt her, Mr. Lincoln. Let her answer. Mrs. Clay, you believe in God. You believe that if you take a sacred oath in the sight of God and on his holy Bible, that you are bound to speak the truth? Yes, but I can't. I just can't. Mrs. Clay, do you appreciate the grave situation your two boys are in? Don't you know that under the law they are equally guilty of murder? That under the law they may both be hanged for it? But I can't tell you. And you can't make me 
Don't you understand I am offering you the life of one son? Take it and tell us which boy killed Scrub White. No! No! Don't you know this court can make you answer my question? Don't you know that you can be sent to jail yourself? That shielding a criminal makes you an accessory to that crime? That by your mistaken affection, you are deliberately sending both boys to the gallows? Don't you know? Enough for that. Your Honor, I protest against the prosecution's attempt to force this woman to decide which of her two sons shall live and which shall die. In her eyes, these boys hold an equal place. Perhaps if my learned friend knew more of the law. I may not know so much of law, Mr. Felder, but I know what's right and what's wrong. And I know what you're asking is wrong. Put yourself in this woman's place, Your Honor. Can you truthfully say you'd do differently? But look at her. She's, she's just a simple, ordinary country woman. She can't even write her own name. Yet has she no feelings, no heart? I've seen Abigail Clay exactly three times in my life, gentlemen. And yet I know everything there is to know about her. I know her because I've seen hundreds of women just like her, working in the fields, kitchens, hovering over some sick and helpless child. Women who say little but do much, who ask for nothing and give all. And I tell you that such a woman will never answer the question that's been put to her here, never. I'd rather, Mrs. Clay, see you lose both your boys than to see you break your heart trying to save one at the expense of the other. So don't tell them. May it please the court. To save the jury any more of these harrowing outbursts, the state will withdraw the question and excuse the witness. No doubt Mr. Lincoln will be glad to hear that she was not the only eyewitness to the murder of Scrub White. Recall Palmer Cass to the stand. <laughs> Mr. Cass, where were you when Scrub White was killed? It was about a hundred yards away, I reckon. And you saw the killing with your own eyes? Yes, sir. Uh, I did. Why didn't you tell us this before? Nobody asked me. Have you told anybody else about this? No, sir. Why not? Well, I... I just didn't want to help get nobody hung, that's all. And that was your only reason, this natural reluctance against being a party to any man's hanging? Yes, sir. Why do you tell us now? Well, I... I just begin to realize that if I don't tell it, Maybe both of them will get hung. <clears throat> Mr. Cass, <clears throat> how could you see so clearly from a distance of 100 yards at 11 o'clock at night? Mm, it, was, it was moon bright. Moon bright? Yes, sir. Then you clearly saw which boy pulled the knife. Yes, sir. I did. The defendants will stand up. <laughs> now, Mr. Cass, tell us, which defendant stabbed and killed Scrub White? It was the bigger of the two. They so! <laughs> Take the prisoners away. Okay.
gets mighty pretty mad. Sorry, folks, you'll have to leave now. We've all got a long, hard day ahead of us tomorrow. You were discussing your political plans, Mr. Douglas. Please go on. Judge. Doggone it. Lincoln, this is against all my principles, but I want to talk to you as an older man. Go ahead, Judge. I'm listening. What I mean to say, uh, dag blame it, is don't you think you want to have some older lawyer with more experience to help you out tomorrow? Are you suggesting that I retire, Judge, or just... Take a back seat. I'm suggesting, that is, if you want me to, I'll speak to Mr. Douglas and get him to act in a sort of advisory capacity. I'm sorry, Judge, but I... I'm just not the sort of fellow can swap horses in the middle of a stream. Then at least change your plea. Accept sentence for your guilty client, and I'll guarantee the state will be lenient with the other. Well, that's a mighty tempting offer. Mighty tempting, but I, I'm afraid it can't be done. You see, I promised those folks I'd stick with the game till the last available card was played. But, man, you'll send both defendants to the gallows, as surely as the moon sets. Maybe. But that's the way it's got to be. Good evening, Judge. is at this time to cross-examine the last witness for the state, Palmer Cass. Palmer Cass! What's he calling him back for? Mr. Cass, yesterday you identified Matt Clay as the killer of Scrub White. Yes, I did. You're sure of that? Well, sure, I'm sure. I just wanted to know. 
You say you were about 100 yards from the scene of the fight? Just about, yeah. Are you familiar with the land over there? Yes, sir. What's the nature of the layout? Well, it's a little clear. Any trees? A few. Where are they? Well, they're between the clearing and the fairground. And you saw right through the trees? No, sir. I was already through the trees when I saw them fighting. Oh, I see. Um, I suppose the clearing was all lit up by lights from the tar barrels. No, sir. How'd you see so well? I told you it was moon bright, Mr. Lincoln. Moon bright? Yes, sir. Of course, if it hadn't been moon bright, you couldn't have seen a hundred yards, could you? Of course not. But you did see it. I told you I saw it, didn't I? What's he driving at? And, uh, the only reason you're telling us this now is because you feel sorry for one of the defendants. Well, I didn't want to see them both get hung. I don't reckon you'd lie about a thing like that. You can step down. No further questions, Your Honor. Oh, Mr. Cass. I forgot there's just one other question I want to ask you. Cass, what'd you have against Scrub White? Well, nothing. What'd you kill him for, then? Kill him. Well, I don't know what you're talking about, Lee. Yes, you do. Look at this. Go on, look at it. It's the Farmer's Almanac. Go ahead, look at it. Look at page 12. You see what it says about the moon? That the moon was only in its first quarter that night and set at 10.21, 40 minutes before the killing took place. So, you right. see, it couldn't have been moon bright, could it? You lied, didn't you, Cass? And you weren't trying to save these boys next, were you? You were trying to save your own, weren't you? Well, come on, weren't you? No. Well, then what'd you lie for? I didn't lie. Oh, yes, you did. It's as plain as a nose on your face, but why? Why did you lie about the moonlight? I don't know what you're talking about, man. I'll tell you what I'm talking about. You lied because you had a fight with Scrub White. But it wasn't about politics. You never mentioned politics. That was your first lie, wasn't it? It was politics, no, I tell you. No, you it were was. fighting about something else. Maybe no. it was money. No. Maybe you owed him money, or maybe he owed you some, no. or maybe he was getting a little graft here and there, and you wanted to get in on it. That ain't true. Maybe it was some girl. No, that ain't right. Well, what was it? It was one of those things. No. Something made you want to get rid of Scrub. Well, you're crazy. Scrub was my friend. Maybe. Just the same you lied. Now, why? Come on, tell us. Why did you say you saw what happened when you didn't see? What? Well, I'll tell you what happened. You heard a row, and you saw the fight start, and you come running, and you saw that Scrub was still living. No. And right there on the ground, you saw the knife that Matt had dropped. No. And you bent over him, and you picked up the no. knife. And your body hid what you were doing. No. And you stabbed him. No, I didn't. You stabbed him in the back and no. killed him. And these two boys, Matt and Adam, they each knew that he didn't do it. Therefore, each thought the other did it. And their mother, she saw the knife in Matt's hand, but she couldn't say so without putting a rope around his neck. And you, you killed him. No. And you lied. And your lie tripped you up. No. That crude, cold-blooded lie that was going to cover up the crime that you committed. No. The lie you can't deny. Now, can you? No. Can you? No. Answer me, you did kill him, didn't you? Didn't you? I, I, I didn't mean to kill him. I was drunk. I was drinking all day. He was my friend. I didn't mean to kill him. I said I didn't mean to kill him. I was drunk. No more questions, Your Honor. Go, witness.
Mr. Lincoln, I... I'm so glad you won. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Lincoln, my congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. Yesterday, I made some remarks about you that I now publicly retract. Furthermore, I give you my sincere promise never to make the mistake of underrating you again. Well, Steve, I don't reckon either of us better underrate each other from here in. Good day. Hurry up, Abe. The crowd's waiting. I better say goodbye to you here. You got quite a ways to go for sundown. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Lincoln. Bye. We ain't got very much. But after all you've done for us. Thank you, ma'am. It's mighty generous of you. Watch out for the ruts, ma'am. Get out, mules. Get out. I'd just about die if I didn't kiss you, Mr. Lincoln. Ain't you going back, Abe? No, I think I might go on a piece. Maybe to the top of that hill. 